Uh, good morning. My name is Richard Bush. I'm the director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies here at Brookings. Uh, and it's my pleasure to invite you to our event this morning on the politics of foreign policy um, with specific res respect to Japan and the United States. Um, this is one of a series of programs uh, that we have had over the last few years uh, that bear on uh, matters uh, uh, concerning the U.S.-Japan alliance and how to ensure its effectiveness um, uh, as it tries to uh, protect peace and security in East Asia and the world. Um, obviously, if uh, um, the domestic political support for an alliance is lacking, uh, it will be a lot harder for the allies to act in concert towards their stated goals. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, support for this particular alliance has uh, um, gone up and down over the years. And um, um, the um, political situation in each country um, has varied. Uh, we've, uh, we got used to um, uh, a lot of discontinuity in uh, uh, the leadership of Japan, one prime minister uh, every year, uh, and now um, um, Prime Minister Abe is uh, breaking records um, because of the length of his uh, time as prime minister. Um, uh, the United States um, has had a major discontinuity um, starting January 20th this year, uh, and uh, so there's a lot to talk about. And um, to do so, we have um, two Brookings scholars to talk about the United States and two scholars from Japan uh, to talk about their country. Um, <clears throat> the, the four are Yoshihide Soya, who's professor of political science at Keio University, uh, Tom Wright, uh, who is director of Brookings Center on US and Europe, uh, senior fellow and also the leader of the project on international order and strategy. Chisaku Ueki, who is a professor at the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies at Waseda University. Uh, and then finally, um, Tarun Chabra, who's a fellow here in the foreign policy program, working on uh, the project of international order and strategy. Um, we will uh, hear from our presenters in that order. Um, they'll talk for 10 to 15 minutes, uh, then the five of us will have a conversation for a few minutes and then we'll um, bring the audience into the conversation. To, so to start, uh, Soya-san, please. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I read somewhere recently that does some place stopped using the term ladies and gentlemen uh, for reasons which I, I may not elaborate, uh, but uh, naturally came out from my mind because I'm half sleepy. Sorry, it's midnight, midnight in Japan. But I try my best to awake myself. Uh, in talking about uh, Japanese security policies uh, in the context of the recently uh, installed new security legislation. And uh, I, I think I've known in Japan and somewhere else as somebody who is basically critical about uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, initiative on this, but uh, as a scholar, I would like to emphasize uh, that that's because of my analysis of, of the policy rather than anything else, uh, let alone personal or anything of that sort. Uh, and in, in order to, once again, as a result of the analysis that I'd like to present, uh, implications uh, could, be, could be a bit uh, critical about uh, the current uh, development of uh, security policies. And uh, 
And in order to make that point clear, uh, allow me to get to basics, uh, which uh, should be familiar to, to many of you, but uh, put those basics in a certain context. It would be hopefully something new or something which you don't necessarily hear often uh, in the Washington community from a Japanese interlocutor. And this is the most basic thing, uh, Article 9 of, of the Japanese Constitution. Uh, Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. And in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. So, so it's not surprising that um, many of our constitutional experts have long read this Article 9 prohibiting both US-Japan Security Treaty and the existence of self-defense forces as, as a purely legal argument. But of course, in reality, uh, the government has continued to reread uh, this article. And in the 1950s, the initial rereading of this led to the establishment of self-defense forces. And a key, key phrase is the first line of the second paragraph in order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, which is renouncing war and the threat of use of force as a means of settling international disputes. So if not as means of settling international disputes, Japan can maintain military forces. That's a long established basic uh, reinterpretation of this Article 9. Sorry about these basics. Uh, but, uh, so, so this is why uh, our government has long uh, refrained from getting into the domain of collective self-defense, let alone collective security uh, under the UN, UN Charter, because those, those domains are considered to exceed the limits uh, as a result of re-reading re of this Article 9. So these are the basics, uh, the basis of the current security legislation. And the legislation for peace and security uh, consisted of 10 revisions of existing laws and an installment of one new law. And uh, to make this complex thing simple, uh, domains where these 10 revisions and one new law uh, meant something could be categorized into three areas of uh, security policies. And one is the situation threatening Japan's survival. So this is, this is the most controversial area where the right of collective self-defense uh, uh, comes into question. And uh, the second is so-called important influencer situations. So this is the expansion of situations surrounding Japan, uh, revision of the guidelines uh, in the 90s. And the third domain has to do with Japanese more active participation in international peacekeeping operation. And from my point of view, uh, the second area and the third domain, uh, of course, there are you know, several problems uh, depending on where you stand. But, but uh, basically, these are, I think, uh, even myself uh, would be supportive of these uh, new areas of Japanese activeness. So, so, so the central question remains as to the first domain, which is, in Japanese, we call it sonritsu kikijitai, situations you know, so existential crisis, situations threatening Japan's survival. And uh, so as a result of this new law, three conditions of the use of force for self-defense uh, has been changed uh, as to the first condition. So black parts are, are traditional kind of three conditions. Uh, when an armed attack against Japan occurs, and secondly, when there is no other appropriate means available to repel the attack, and third, use of force should be limited to the minimum extent necessary. And the second and the third conditions remain the same. But as to the first condition, this red uh, part was added as a result of the new security legislation. That is, when an armed attack against a foreign country, uh, I think the US is not necessarily the single country uh, mentioned here. Uh, gen gen generally, when an armed attack against a foreign country that is in a close relationship with Japan occurs and as a result threatens Japan's survival, 
and poses a clear danger to fundamentally overturn people's right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. American people should be familiar with the last part. Uh, and and uh, so, so this red part implies the exercise of the right of correct self-defense, which exceeds, I mean, domains of Japan's uh, traditionally held, you know, self-defense for, strictly for self-defense uh, purposes. But this uh, collective self-defense, uh, politically speaking, in, in our domestic context, is a result of a series of compromises on the part of uh, particularly Prime Minister Abe and other politicians who associate themselves closely with the Prime Minister. And uh, of course, it's, it's a dream for our leader to revise the constitution. And it's not secret. He, he has stated uh, you know, uh, privately and officially in a very explicit way. And the, the revision of the constitution uh, is important, uh, almost like as a symbolism. And the departure from the post-war regime, I think, uh, tells uh, what uh, this uh, essentially Maybe not that ideological, but uh, you know this kind of sim symbolic uh, sort of uh, 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 you know agenda uh, to get out of the post-war regime, and the so initial thing which Prime Minister Abe sort of floated as an idea to to political world and, and the general public was changing Article 96 of the Constitution, and Article 96 of the Constitution says. Amendments to this constitution shall be initiated by the Diet through a concurring vote of two-thirds or more of all the members of each house. And uh, the, the proposal was to change this two-thirds or more to a majority. So, so lower the barrier of, uh, in proposing constitutional revision in the Diet. But this proposal has turned out to be so unpopular in the general public. Even the Sankei Shinbun affiliated sort of uh, 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 public opinion polls, uh, result was negative uh, views prevailed over positive views uh, for, for, for this proposal. So after that, Prime Minister Abe stopped talking about this and came the collective security issue. So in this sequence, uh, collective security as a domestic political agenda originates uh, from his desire to the post-war constitution and, and to sort of reset the occupation regime, uh, so to speak. So this is, the, again, the repetition of the red part, uh, right of collective self-defense. But uh, the trick here was this was done without touching the Article 9. So this has to be explained to the general public. This still remains within the domain which Article 9 uh, permits. And when an armed attack against a foreign country that in a close relationship with Japan occurs and the result threatens Japan's survival, so this is critical, as a result threatens Japan's survival and poses a clear danger to blah, blah, blah. So this, this has to do with Japan's own security and existence. So which is regarded as legitimate in the spirit of Article 9. So as a result of this constitutional uh, interpretation, this domain where Japan you know, uh, sort of got into by making it uh, constitutional to exercise the right of collective self-defense can be said as satisfying only half of the full right of collective self-defense as justified by the United Nations. So, so Japan does not exercise the right of collective self-defense self -defense in areas which goes beyond the cases where Japan's survival is threatened. So I, I sometimes talk to the listeners, audience, and students uh, half jokingly and half seriously in terms of, of the logic. If Mexico attacks the United States, would that pose a danger of Japanese security or existence? Of course, it's up to the interpretation of the incumbent government, but may maybe not. So, 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 this is, so, so this is the point that I wanted to highlight in the context of 
UN Charter Article 51. The right of collective self-defense is recognized as a legitimate uh, right of, of a sovereign nation uh, by the UN Charter uh, 51. Nothing in the current charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. So, so, so the right of collective self-defense is an internationalist I mean, right. Uh, uh, so this is a sort of interim measure uh, in, in the stages and the areas where UN would not function on the basis of its charter. So, 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 so this right is, a, is, is kind of in, in, internationalist right, not domestic nationalist right. And, uh, but Japan had to justify this in the name of defense of Japan, again, because of Article 9. And so that's, a, that's a legal sort of uh, context in which uh, this could be interpreted. And again, uh, if you put this in, in the post-war context of evolution of Japanese security policies, uh, this was almost a, as if a deja vu, we are watching the deja vu, which is expansion of Japan's security policy uh, got realized as a result of reinterpreting Article 9 reinterpreting the sort of you know, uh, realm uh, which Article 9 uh, would allow. And uh, the f first, first case was in the 50s. Self-defense force laws and defense agency law were enacted in 1954 without changing Article 9. So as a result, political argument and the move to revise the Constitution subsided substantially. J Japan could have uh, self-defense force military without changing Article 9. Before this, this was rather a logical and rational uh, argument that in order for Japan to have the military, Article 9 needs to be changed. That was almost uh, common sense uh, uh, bef before, before this among many politicians. And, uh, but but uh, Japan managed to have established self-defense force without changing Article 9. So argument for changing Article 9 naturally subsided after that. And the second case would be the revision of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty achieved by the Kishi government. And the motivation of Kishi was clearly so-called nationalism. And he wanted to achieve so-called equal partnership with the, with the United States by revising the uh, 1951 original security treaty, which Shigeru Yoshida signed with the United States. So that to the extent Japan achieved uh, you know, uh, equality, there, there is no such thing for any country, but, uh, but uh, rhetorically, to the extent Japan achieves, uh, you know, equality with the U.S., Japan's autonomy will be expanded. Uh, so, so that was the logic of the security treaty revision uh, uh, led by Kishi, and the motivation was clearly nationalism. But as a result, if you look at a, a, a bird-eye view, more macro view, as a result of the revision, alliance setup became more consolidated and institutionalized. And if, if you would like to use the term Japan's dependence on the U.S., Japan's dependence on the U.S. became more explicit and more institutionalized as a result of the revision of the treaty. And uh, this treaty, of course, is the current security treaty, which uh, Japan and the U.S. has. And Abe's case of right of collective self-defense uh, was realized by complying, complying with the logic of Article 9, and as a result, U.S.-Japan alliance was strengthened. These are nothing but postal regimes, basic, basic postal regimes. And so, 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 so the drive uh, came, which came out of the motivation of getting out of the postal regime ended up strengthening the postal regime, so to speak. So this is what I might mean by deja vu, you know, so, kind of, so, and. Uh, in that sense, this is not really new. And my final point has to do with the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, uh, revised by Kishi in 1960. And the key, key clauses are Article 6 and 5. And the Article 6 says, for the purpose of contributing to the security of Japan and the maintenance of international peace and security in the Far East, U.S. is granted the use by its land, air, and naval forces or facilities and areas in Japan. And it's, it's often called the Far Eastern Clause, but it basically justifies American military presence in Japan 
uh, in the name of defense of Japan as well as security of East Asia. And Article 5, each party recognizes that an armed attack against each par either party in the territories under the administration of Japan would be dangerous to its own peace and security and declares that it would act to meet a common danger in accordance with its constitutional provisions and processes. So this uh, red part in the territories under the administration of Japan is, is because of the Article 9. But uh, this is often called as U.S. commitment to defending Japan, which is not entirely wrong, of course. But the essence of this clause is collective self-defense. And this point becomes obvious if you compare this to Article 4 of ANZAS Treaty. Each party recognized that an armed attack in the Pacific area on any of the parties would be dangerous to its own peace and security and declared that it would act to meet the, you know, the, so the only difference, substantial difference has to do with this red part. U.S.-Japan Security Treaty in the territories under the administration of Japan, in ANZAS Treaty, in the Pacific area. So this is clearly collective self-defense between Australia and the United States. And, uh, and in case of Japan, in the territories under the administration of Japan because of Article 9. So this is essentially a clause about collective self-defense uh, on the basis of uh, UN Charter 51. And if, if I come to this point, uh, I have to say something which nobody in Japan is arguing about. I haven't heard of anybody saying the same thing. That is, as a result of changing the, you know, the right of collective self-defense, this red part should be rewritten, theoretically speaking. Because now Japan's security legislation has gone beyond the, the area. I mean, under, under the territory, in the, in the territories under the administration of Japan. So, so Japan is, can now exercise the right in existential crisis, which is, goes beyond the Japanese territories under the administration of Japan. But none of us is making this point. And this is a dangerous point to, to state explicitly, because I don't think both Washington and Tokyo can handle this issue. So I hope President Trump would not notice it. And if he, if he starts, if he notices it, and if he starts to present this question to the Japanese government, now, you know, you can help us, uh, not only in crisis in Japanese territories, but beyond, if it has, you know, implications for your country. And Korean Peninsula is clearly such, such a contingency. And South China Sea, I'm not sure. Once again, it's up to the decision by the incumbent government. So, so, so the domain where Japan can exercise the right of collective self-defense used to be limited to the territories under the administration of Japan. But now it has gone beyond, legally speaking, legally speaking. But there is no prepar preparation for this uh, as, as, as long as I look at it. So I have, to, I have to come to the conclusion that this right of collective self-defense became an important agenda because of the original intention or wish to revise the Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, but was not necessarily considered in a realistic kind of military and strategic context of, of the region. So here, real question is, if the current Japanese government or future governments are determined to put this new right into practice, if needs be, and uh, the, the clearest uh, case would be Korean Peninsula, clearly, if, if something happens in, in the Korean Peninsula. Jap so legally speaking, Japanese Prime Minister can order self-defense forces to be deployed. But, but we haven't done any preparation, and uh, I see no indication that, that we are getting into that domain. So, so realizing this was an end goal in itself, uh, domestically speaking, domestically speaking. Uh, that's one, one conclusion of mine. But if you look at the implications of, for security policy, it's not a big deal. You know, almost all sovereign nations in the, in the world have exercised this right. You know, Australia has been fighting almost all American wars, right, from, from the Korean War to, to the Gulf War. 
So it's not a big deal if, you know, as a security policy. And we have not reached this full exercise of the right yet. You know, only half of it at most, maybe less than half. And it's a big help for the U.S. strategy and security of uh, Korea. Because a country which is in close relation with Japan, South Korea is clearly. And so if something happens to South Korea, I think, again, legally speaking, uh, our government and our leader can order self-defense forces to be deployed by defining the situation as an existential crisis for Japanese security. And the foundation of security cooperation with East Asian countries and international peace cooperation. So, so many of us uh, you know, uh, who, who are selling this policy to, to the world community, I think are basically talking about these external dimensions. And these are not wrong. These are not wrong. As a security policy, I mean, I think uh, these are the sort of positive implications of the new security bill. But if you look at domestic context, there are lots of inconsistencies, lots of inconsistencies. Motivations are inward looking, basically, as I said. But, in, but implications are maybe international. And, uh, and our <coughs> leaders often use internationalist <coughs> rhetorics to justify these internally motivated changes in security policies. So this is a fundamental gap, fundamental gap. So why does the public support this other agenda? I think threat perceptions of China and North Korea uh, plays a big role in the perceptions of the people. And history, as a background, history friction with China and Korea also is, uh, I think, a very important sort of uh, a factor uh, when public you know, believes these changes are beneficial for Japan in an ever worsening security environment in East Asia. But Article 9 and the alliance regime works almost as an invisible hand. So motivations which exist beyond this framework, premised on constitution and the alliance with the US, are almost always brought back into this box, which is what I meant by deja vu uh, from, from the 50s. So sense of nationalism, you know, sense of uh, achieving autonomy, you know, those, 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 those factors, I mean, comp make po po politics complex, decision-making process complex, but eventually outcome will fall within these parameters. That's what we have seen in the post-war evolution of Japanese security policies. So, so that's what I mean by invisible hand. And behind this, why this has been so robust, of course, history of war, which, which is normal, so fundamental. We cannot get out of this, you know, legacies so easily. And Japan's post-war culture of pacifism and militarism, of course, play, still plays a big role. But I think more importantly, as a result of this ideologically motivated agenda become, uh, becoming prominent, this leads to the division of Japanese politics and even, even nationalism uh, between the so-called right and left. So, so Japan may look more harmonious compared to the U.S., but I think uh, just like President Trump is dividing America, uh, I, I think Abe's agenda is dividing Japan. And uh, so, so as a result, again, in a domestic context, uh, Abe's agenda is a little bit astray and in confusion, I think. And uh, the war history and the constitution are two sides of the same coin. So if you want to change the constitution, you have to do something about the war history. And then I think that's the only way you know, Japan can come to actually revising Article 9. As a, personal, as a personal opinion, I think we need to revise Article 9 in one way or another. But on the, uh, on the basis of future-oriented strategy, rather than uh, driven by a sense of uh, sort of trauma about the occupation or, or post-war history. And uh, so, so, so this uh, dealing with do, these two sides of the coin, I think is a truly national agenda uh, for Japan as we move into the future. But I don't think uh, this has been dealt very well and strategically under the 
apparent uh, leadership. And uh, that's, that's what I mean by sort of inconsistencies in domestic context. So this gap between how these policies are viewed outside of Japan and uh, what, what's happening inside Japan domestically and otherwise, I mean, this, this is a fundamental barrier to the progress of Prime Minister Abe's agenda, I think. So it's not easy to come to changing Article 9. And uh, my, my bet is it's going to take more, more time. Two-thirds majority supporting the Constitution is one thing. And two-thirds majority agreeing on specific proposal of changing Constitution is totally another. And two-thirds majority in support of the Constitution, I think, means we have finally get to the start line of what would be a long-term process of debating uh, what it, it ought to be in the future. So, so I'll finish here, and sorry, I have extended a little bit, uh, maybe more than a little bit, but I hope we will get into lively discussions after this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Should I just close this? Is that the, the world won't end? <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you for those remarks. I, I learned a lot. Um, and thank you, Richard, for the invitation to, uh, to speak with you all uh, here this morning. And my name is Tom Wright. Uh, uh, joy going to Japan um, for the last few years. And I think the role of domestic politics, I think, is incredibly important. So I want to talk mainly about the U.S. side um, and look forward then to the conversation. But I'd just like to make four um, points. And the first really is on how important it is to actually get the support of the American people uh, for uh, foreign policy and for national security policy, particularly uh, in the Asia Pacific. And I'm reminded of a story um, after World War II in, in sort of late 1945, um, after the war uh, was won in Europe and in the Pacific. And the United States Congress had a proposal to it to provide a loan on pretty favorable terms to Great Britain. So Britain was America's ally uh, in the war. It was in pretty desperate economic shape uh, after it. Um, the US was asked to provide a loan at significantly higher interest rates than normal, so it would make a profit um, on the enterprise. And it was incredibly controversial. Uh, Congress is deeply opposed to it. Um, there was huge resistance. The feeling was, why should the British be coming to the US uh, to be bailed out? Uh, they should sort of deal with this on their own. And Truman wanted uh, to have a robust American engagement uh, in Europe. And he made the positive case for it, but it completely fell flat. And it was only when the threat of communism really emerged in 1946 that they were able to scare the living daylights out of people and actually get the loan through. And remember that this is actually a loan um, that would have financially benefited uh, the taxpayers, not one um, that was a giveaway um, or a gift. And what I think that shows, and when you look later on at um, the late 1940s, these incredible debates that took place about the alliance structure, uh, mainly in Europe, but also in Asia, about the Marshall Plan, which is also incredibly um, controversial at the time, that all of these enterprises required real effort by the executive branch to try to mobilize the American people and convince them that this was incredibly important, that they should put their money and their resources and their effort and their attention behind this effort because it was existential uh, for the nation. The, the happy news, I think, and this is my first point, is that today most of that infrastructure is already in place. There's really nothing like either the loan or the Marshall Plan or the alliances that requires the type of activity on Capitol Hill and in the country as a whole to create uh, the infrastructure capable of dealing uh, with the foreign policy challenges of the 21st century. The infrastructure that is, was put in place then uh, may be outdated in its intent, but it's essentially fungible. 
Uh, so the alliances were created to contain the Soviet Union, but they can be used and are being used and have always been envisaged as much broader uh, in scope. And so I think we're actually incredibly lucky um, that all of, all, of, all of the efforts of previous um, generations has sort of stood this test of time. And I'm a little bit sanguine about the, um, and I'll, I'll get on to the America first uh, sort of view and isolationist sentiment bubbling up, uh, because when you look at what the United States needs to do with Japan or what the United States needs to do in Asia, most of it can happen uh, without the need for mass mobilization. Uh, freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea don't require um, congressional approval. Deepening the alliance uh, with uh, Japan and, 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 and better relations between the president and the prime minister can all happen uh, pretty much automatically. Deepening security cooperation um, can happen pretty much automatically um, if there's the will there um, by the um, by the executive branch. Now, of course, economics, I think, is something of a, a is something of an exception in this, in that there are uh, routinely new sort of initiatives that do require mobilization, TPP uh, being a prime example. And when that's required, it can run into trouble. Um, but there's a lot on the economic side even, and that the most important part of the economic side are not these new initiatives, but actually the pre-existing economic relationships, the deep interdependence on the investment side already on the trade side, and um, uh, that goes on uh, pretty much automatically because of things that were put in place before. Um, so I think we have a pretty solid base, and we should be careful not to maybe uh, get too worried uh, when we see uh, some of this isolation of sentiment um, bubble up. And we should remember um, that in our sort of present system, the status quo is actually a lot stickier and a lot easier to uphold than radical changes to sort of impose. It's harder um, for politicians uh, to fundamentally remake the relationship of the US uh, to the world than it is to adjust and sort of adapt within the existing framework. With that said, I, I do think, and this is my second point, we are seeing the reemergence of a political movement in the US that has been dormant uh, for some time. And that is whether we call it America first or isolationism or nationalism. I think it is true that since World War II, there has basically been a consensus in both parties behind uh, internationalist foreign policy, behind defining US interests as wrapped up in a healthy global system, whether we call that a liberal international order, a post-war order, or just US primacy or something else. That has been sort of the driving force, I think, in both parties. Um, it's really not since the days of Robert Taft that we've seen a more sort of nationalistic or, or narrowly defined um, agenda in the mainstream um, of one of the two parties. And with Trump, I think that movement has been reawakened. And we will find out whether or not that is a permanent change or a temporary um, aberration. I think a lot will uh, be told in the elections of 2018 um, and 2020. Um, but if there is a more long-term long shift, I think we may see repercussions uh, over time because if, if uh, that position wins continuous elections, something um, will change. I think if you look back over the last year, the effect of the America First position and of Trump's view has been quite limited um, for one reason, I think above all others, which is when he was elected, um, he and his, uh, those who sort of believed in what he believes, uh, like Steve Bannon um, and others, had very few, almost no people who were qualified for high office and confirmable by the Senate. So they had nobody who could sort of implement their worldview, and they had no real plans to turn those visceral beliefs uh, into policy. They had a handful of people like Michael Flynn and a few others who could go into the White House, and we know uh, how that turned out. Um, but they, they did, I think, lack that capacity. And Lacking that capacity, they had to turn uh, to others, particularly to the retired military, who are very mainstream and quite traditionalist. And that, I think, has led to a continuity in US foreign policy. But um, that could change. You know, the presidency of the United States is an incredibly powerful office. That person 
can you know, re-engineer it from the inside. They can figure it out over time. They can figure out the bureaucracy. They can find people, either opportunistic people who pledge uh, to be more loyalist uh, than the existing team, or people who do actually genuinely believe in what he believes and might start out more at a more junior level but advance. And over time, they could build an America first uh, position. Uh, so I think that we shouldn't be too um, complacent. If you do believe in an internationalist foreign policy, you shouldn't be too complacent from the last 10 months and necessarily believe that because we started out with some instability and then it became more familiar and more traditional that we are necessarily on a linear path. I think the moment is quite sort of volatile, but a lot of it has to do with this expert or elite capacity uh, within the government on these different uh, schools of thought. And I think it is um, somewhat um, in flux. I think on Japan, it's interesting to note that the administration, I think, when, when President Trump came in, that he had a long history of hostility uh, toward Japan, dating back to the mid-'80s, I suspect because of sort of the role of the rising Japanese economy at the time, uh, particularly in New York and on, on foreign investment into, into the U.S., but the good news is that he has changed his view, I think because he views Prime Minister Abe as Japan and he likes Abe and therefore um, he likes Japan. Um, and I think that sort of element of, uh, of the president to view things highly personally and to develop personal relationships uh, with uh, foreign leaders was something that Prime Minister Abe knew, I think, very early on and very wisely uh, uh, proceeded on to, to go to, uh, to visit President Trump during the transition and then again shortly after uh, he was sworn in um, to office. So I think that that sort of risk was headed off of the pass uh, a little bit. I would just say also on this, um, on this second uh, point that it's not just Republicans uh, that we need to sort of look at in terms of the influence of an America first view. Um, as my colleague Bob Kagan likes to say, if you look at the last election and the major figures in it, uh, Ted Cruz maybe on the Republican side, Bernie Sanders uh, uh, and Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side, and of course President Trump, um, three of the four uh, essentially wanted to do most less in the world. Three of the four uh, viewed domestic imperatives as far more important uh, than a global role. Hillary Clinton, I think, was the outlier uh, in that. And so we, are think, are going to find on both sides of the aisle whether or not that domestic uh, sort of nation building at home or domestic focus or more narrowly defined sense of the national interest prevails or whether it will be some reversion uh, to the pre-2016 um, consensus. My third point is just on public opinion because the Chicago Council, where I used to work before I came here, um, had a very interesting poll um, a few months ago that some of you may have seen. And it was titled, What Americans Think About America First. And the Chicago Council found that basically since President Trump came on the scene so as a candidate and then as president, that there's been a significant shift back toward a traditional American foreign policy away from what he's been arguing. So there's been something of a counter-reaction uh, to some of the things, things that he has been saying. So the percentage of Americans who say maintaining alliances is very important rose from 40% in 2016 uh, to 49% in 2017. Um, many more said it's important. That was vastly more than the number who said it was unimportant um, or bad. A record number of Americans in 2017 recognized the benefits of international trade and free trade. That's significantly up uh, from last year. On alliances in East Asia, uh, there's interestingly something of a partisan divide. 66% of Democrats say they believe that the alliances benefit the U.S. mainly or both the U.S. and the allies compared to 31% who say they benefit mainly the allies or neither the U.S. nor the allies. So that's basically 66 to 31. For Republicans, those figures are 45% saying they benefit the U.S. or both and 44% um, saying they benefit mainly the allies or neither. And so that's more of an even divide. So that may be one area um, where there is a little bit of a gap, but overall the support for the alliances 
is pretty strong. The News for Japan is pretty good. 67% of Democrats say they have full confidence in Japan um, as an ally, 64% of Republicans, and 61% of independents. So those are very high numbers and up again from, um, from the previous uh, year. So I think what that shows us is that the election may have been about many things. Right, it could have been about the fact that people didn't like Hillary Clinton or they wanted to change in Washington or they really liked you know, Donald Trump's wall or something else, but it wasn't necessarily about foreign policy and it wasn't about alliances and it wasn't about Russia. And so when, when, when the president has these strong views, it's a temptation to see it as an endorsement. And it, to some degree, it is an endorsement of his position because he did win um, the election. But when you look at it, it's not necessarily that he won because of those um, views. And I think we do see a bit of a gap um, there. Um, just one final observation on the polling data. One of the things they, the Chicago Council found that was quite interesting is there is a gap between Republicans in general and Trump Republicans. And Trump Republicans, which is a much smaller percentage, I think I can't recall offhand the percentage of overall Republicans, but they um, do tend to tack more toward the president's sort of views in America first. And so you see a big divide uh, within the Republican Party on that, but the overall numbers are pretty supportive. The final point is I do think that there are a couple of areas that could pose a problem, uh, uh, particularly as regards US policy uh, in Asia. And um, one is North Korea, and the second is sort of globalization uh, and trade. I was interested to read an interview by, uh, with Steve Bannon in the American Prospect a couple of days before he left, in which he said that he would favor a deal uh, on North Korea that would involve the withdrawal of all US troops from South Korea in exchange for a freeze. Right, which of course is a terrible deal, um, and uh, 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 and will be a huge concession uh, to Kim Jong Un. But I, I do think speaks to uh, the notion that if you define interest very narrowly, you only really care about homeland security, and you don't care too much about extended deterrence or the alliances. Now that is not the position um, of the Trump administration. But extended deterrence is always very difficult. It was very difficult in the Cold War, and it will be very difficult in the future because you essentially have to promise that you care as much about a foreign city as you do about a domestic city. And that, I think, will be a challenge, will be a challenge for any administration to communicate the case for that in the same way that administrations during the Cold War did. And we may, that may not be an issue necessarily this year or next year or the year after, but if this goes on for 10, 20, 30 years, it's possible that over time there could be a risk of decoupling. And so the same type of strategic communication and clarity is probably important to address that domestic uh, vulnerability. Um, and finally, just on globalization, I think this is the one exception to what I said earlier in terms of the infrastructure being in place. And the thing that sort of struck me about TPP, uh, which I uh, supported and support, and also TTIP and some of these other uh, endeavors, is that if you look at the um, what actually sort of concerns people about the global economy, it's not necessarily market access and regulatory alignment. Right, it's the fact um, that they were worried about uh, automation of technologies and the impact on jobs, or they're worried about uh, Chinese mercantilist uh, behavior, or they're worried about uh, a wide variety of things, whether it's you know um, uh, corporate tax uh, avoidance or any of these number of issues on globalization that tend to get people passionate. And so the question would be, um, is it actually uh, in our interest to be working on these very narrow um, agreements on increasing market access, given the amount of political capital it requires to actually get them over the line, when they may not actually uh, succeed in ratification uh, in here or in, uh, in other countries? Or uh, is it necessary to try to work with partners and allies on these uh, broad questions of concerns about globalization and um, that are sort of shared uh, by voters in all these countries. And that's something, an argument uh, that Larry Summers and some others have been making. You could, of course, do both, but I think that's something that's worth sort of considering in terms of how to ensure uh, sort of domestic support behind uh, foreign economic policy. But overall, um, on the sort of uh, uh, terms of the domestic politics in the US, I'm pretty optimistic 
about the ability um, of the executive branch, if they so wish, uh, to maintain traditional uh, foreign policy, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, important allies like Japan, um, and sort of ride out these temporary storms. So thank you very much. While we get ready, let me just uh, thank uh, Brookings Institution and uh, uh, Richard, Dr. Richard Bush in particular for bringing me here to uh, Washington DC and I'm Chicago Wiki as uh, uh, Richard has introduced me a little earlier. Um, there is, I think, if there are a few cities that I am really excited in coming and, and with everything that's happening in the city, Washington is definitely on the top of the list because here I think is a place that questions are being asked and answers are sort of sought out. And I, I truly believe in the institution, democratic institution and its ability to really ask hard questions and uh, through the marketplace of ideas that uh, we try to seek the best answers possible. And to me, Brookings Institution really is a realization of, of that principle. And uh, therefore, I am very honored today to speak to you for about 15 minutes on the domestic uh, politics and its implications to uh, Japan's uh, foreign policy. So with that, let me start. Uh, so I'm asking uh, Japan's role in the world, and is it going to head to pacifist, isolationist, or proactive internationalist. Okay, um, I'm not sure how to do this. Uh, okay, so um, some of the questions that are on my mind, and uh, um, of course, Richard uh, prompted me to think about these things. So what does the public opinion tell us about Japan's future? And will the Abe government succeed in creating what he himself called a new Japan? And what are the drivers, uh, so in domestic politics and also in, uh, uh, in uh, international uh, relations? So just a, a quick roadmap of my talk. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, Prime Minister Abe's agenda and efforts so far, and of course, Professor Sawyer has provided with us with details of that already. Um, and what are the recent developments and, uh, uh, and public opinion trends from the surveys that are taken more recently? And, uh, and I want to explore about the possible drivers of change and prospects. Okay, so what are uh, Prime Minister Abe's agenda so far? Um, one definitely is to try to make Japan a normal nation uh, with a question mark, right? Um, so he started off, as uh, Soya uh, Sensei had said, that uh, an overall uh, revision of the post-war uh, regime, as it were, as a revision of the Article 9, and, and not just uh, changing the clauses or adding the clause as he is uh, trying to do now, but really a fundamental uh, change in the revision probably was an ideal uh, agenda for him. Uh, but at this point, maybe it's just any revision uh, is what he is trying to, to achieve rather than the, the overall uh, fundamental revision. So four revisions that are on the table is one is adding SDF self-defense force 
in the Constitution. Uh, the background to this is many of the legal scholars think that uh, self-defense force is uh, anti-constitutional. So he has been saying that uh, you know he met this uh, self-defense force officer who was asked by his son, uh, Daddy, are you doing something that is against the Constitution? And he argues that it is not right for somebody who is defending and, and basically uh, you know, spending his days and, and life for our country uh, to be asked such a question. So he wants to put the third clause in the Article 9. Um, but this is just an addition and only sort of endorsing what many people already think as uh, many, many Japanese already think that self-defense force obviously is a legitimate being. Um, so two is free education. Um, he is uh, saying that uh, he wants to make education free and put that in the constitution. And three is uh, um, massive disaster special measures, which he says which would uh, ensure that uh, uh, the diet, even if it reaches a full term, can stay on uh, without having a general election, should there be a massive earthquake, for example. And the fourth is electoral merger, uh, etc. So obviously the, the first one is the one that Prime Minister Abe is trying to do, and the second, free education, is sort of a means to make, it, make the revision more acceptable by, by the people. So I said nationalist versus realist. So the agenda and, and his probably ideal goal would be a more nationalist origin, as we heard from Professor Sawyer. But uh, he has been conducting his policies quite realistically. So there's a pull against being a nationalist agenda and a realist agenda. Realist being what is achievable domestically and also the foreign policy imp implications of what, what Japan needs to do is making him realist. Um, so the two opposing thing is one is self-defense and the other one is proactive contribution to peace. And these are actually uh, sort of a, um, opposite conceptions, as it were, although it's been explained together. Um, and national interest, uh, being de defending the national interest of Japan and defending the liberal international order. Um, so he has been saying no nation can defend by itself, which is probably true, and, and, but he, and he also says the world needs Japan. Therefore, Japan needs to uh, change its laws, as it did, and also change the constitution in order to do that. He has also said about, talked about national crisis, uh, meaning the North Korean missile threats, and also has been saying it's a dangerous world out there. So these are the messages he's been saying why these, uh, uh, you know, first the security laws bills are necessary and also uh, revision might be necessary. So these, these are all sort of uh, being repeated uh, to the people, but, but if you realize that the, it has a component of being a narrowly nationalist, uh, in, you know, national interest defense versus uh, liberal international order defense, those are sort of two, two different things. So what are the recent developments? There was a general election in October 22nd of 20. 17 this year, and uh, um, it was more than a year and a half uh, away from its full term. So he dissolved the, the diet, the government, uh, the, the parliament. And the reasons he gave, you, need, you do need a reason to dissolve the, the parliament. So he gave two reasons. He said it's a national crisis election, and one was North Korea, and the other one was falling birth rate, which is only 1.744 at the moment, an aging population. Uh, where 27% 20, of Japanese population over the age of, uh, uh, sorry, 65%, 65 years or older, uh, make up the 27% of Japanese population. So it's a, it's that that. So two things he said. These are national crises. He said. So therefore, he dissolved the parliament to ask the people, um, and the government won, and uh, it gained the seats more than the two-thirds, which is necessary to revise the constitution. But the question is, did they really win? And uh, in some ways, the election is called, the, it was an own goal by the opposition because it was fragmented. Uh, let me just show you this. Uh, and so uh, two-thirds is 310 seats in the diet. And the LDP, Liberal Democratic Party, and Komeito, uh, its coalition uh, party, uh, got 313 seats, so three seats more than what is necessary. And the opposition only got one 
30. So it seems that uh, it was a, a massive victory. However, uh, as I said, is, was it really a victory? Um, so although the seat-wise, uh, LDP and Komeito received 313 and oppositions only 130, the actual pop the percentage of the, the votes that, that the opposition and the, the incumbent, the government received is 46.8% for the government, two parties, and 53.2% uh, for the opposition parties. So because of the electoral system, where it's uh, easier, it, it's, Japan changed its electoral election system in the 90s, uh, where it's a smaller electoral system, which is easier, uh, The one they only have one candidate, one, one a seat to an election. Uh, electorate, so this could happen. So although the opposition actually got more uh, than than the uh, the government did, uh, it didn't reflect in the seats because oppositions were basically eating up the their votes by themselves because they were fragmented. Uh, but you could see that people actually didn't vote for the government per se. So so the, the th 313 seats is somewhat uh, deceptive if you think that the government had a really big uh, support. Um, one other thing, a new party was formed during uh, the election uh, campaign. Uh, it was called the Constitutional Democratic Party. Uh, it's an offspring from the, uh, the DPJ, Democratic Party of Japan. And they only had 15 seats when the parliament was dissolved, and, but gained 55 seats. This is a picture from one of their rallies in Shinjuku, and it's, it's quite um, unusual for uh, you know, rather ordinary people together uh, in uh, uh, speeches like this. So uh, that's something that is happening uh, that we I wanted to share with you. So what are the public opinion trends? Uh, this is my take on it, and uh, I'd like to look a little bit further into this. I think the public is still adverse to the use of force beyond Japan, and although, uh, having said that, I think the public is more willing to use force for self-defense. Uh, more opposed to the revision of Article 9, and there are uh, no generational difference in that. Um, so if the people are asked, do you think you need to revise the Constitution, and this is uh, from the NHK uh, public broadcasting uh, polls from uh, this year, um, only if the, the red is the yes. Uh, red is the yes and no, and, and, and yes is uh, the, the blue. So 43% of the people said uh, yes. Uh, so although it might be a bit more than no, it's still small. And, uh, uh, and actually in 2002, 58% of the people said yes. Probably uh, after the September 11th, maybe people thought those things were necessary. But it's now down again to 43%. Um, but this is the overall revision of the Constitution. And, and the people were asked, do you think you need to revise the, the Article 9? Then the, 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 the figures, the numbers drop considerably. Only 25% of the respondents say that they think, they do think that they, they, they need to revise Article 9. And, and this trend is young and old alike. Uh, the men, for some reason, NHK doesn't give an overall, but they split up the, <laughs> the, the results in men and women. So, so you have to see them both sort of a... Um. So in the 70s, uh, people 70s and older, 27% uh, and 13%, so still low. So, so there's some, probably a little bit more on the 60s side, but the, you clearly can't say that the young people are more are supportive of the revision at all. And uh, this is a, another survey. It's a different survey from Asahi, which was conducted in March, April of this year, asking people, what are your reasons for uh, no to the revision? And 69% of the people this time said no. And, and one is Japan has renounced the war, uh, 54%. Uh, 34 is what it would be if, in the total, not just the, amongst the people who said uh, no, uh, the, but the, the to total number uh, out of the 100%. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, self-defense force can operate without the revision is 29%. This is interesting because in some ways, um, 
in reinterpreting the constitution and the passing of those laws actually made it harder for the government, uh, Prime Minister Abe, to change the constitution because many feel that uh, Japan's uh, security is now, and, and, and also because Prime Minister has explained it that way, uh, that uh, it's, it's now adequate, that you, there is less need for the revision because the security bills in place and you can actually do the collective right of self-defense when it's necessary. And 12% said that uh, we'll de destabilize East Asia. Um, and those who said, yes, we need to change the constitution, the Article 9, uh, which was 29% of the total, and uh, uh, said 35% uh, said should write the SDF explicitly. This is what the Prime Minister has been saying, so they agree with him. And will strengthen US-Japan alliance and East Asia regional stability is 32%. <coughs> and should contribute more to international peace is 24%. Uh, and also asked, uh, what do you think, what can the SDF do abroad? Uh, this is again interesting. 92%, um, and this is a multiple choice, 92% said that disaster relief, helping people, uh, victims of disaster relief overseas. And 77% said transport Japanese in danger. 62% uh, said United Nations uh, peacekeeping operations, 39 mine sweeping and important sea lanes. Here you get a little bit strategic and security, but the first, first, uh, uh, the, the first one is clearly uh, not your geopolitical security per se, and the second one is more uh, saving the Japanese citizens, so not necessarily international. Um, 18, you use force to help UN workers and soldiers under attack. Um, 15 said logistical support, fuel and weapons to US forces. Uh, and four said fighting with US forces in the front line. So the 15 said that logistical in the, in the rear area and four, only 4% four says fighting with US forces in front line. So still fairly um, um, pacifist or non-use non of force in, even when they uh, think of uh, uh, SDF's activities abroad. And uh, the cabinet office has been asking the same questions uh, for a long time. And uh, what do you think is that Japan's role in the world? And uh, uh, the contributions to, and that the biggest one is world peace through regional stability, uh, which is 56% or so, and, uh, um, and contribute to global issues like global warming uh, and disarmament, uh, development assistance, ODA, world economy. Uh, and here I'd like to point to this, uh, uh, only about 30 some percent said uh, uh, contribute to spreading and, and protecting freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. This is interesting because the reason why I say is the current government has been saying that the rule of law is extremely important for East Asia and that Japan should uh, be the Ghana of, of this. But it seems that uh, it's not the high on the agenda of the things that people think of as a role in for Japan. Humanitarian assistance to refugees is uh, 30 some percent as well. So it seems that there are two forces that are pulling uh, things in the opposite directions. So threats to national security, uh, such as national missiles and clash over the Senkaku Islands, those things clearly make the people uh, get worried about uh, the international uh, environment and therefore be more accepting of, of maybe the need when, when they are explained that uh, Japan should have a, a new set of uh, uh, security laws and also change their, their constitution, they're most uh, accepting of the idea. Even if they're not perfectly comfortable with it, they think maybe it's inevitable. Um, and this will lead Japan to closer to United States and uh, uh, increase the U.S.-Japan uh, 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 security cooperation um, and collective right of self-defense. And in some ways, um, I, I think the bills are already, the, the laws are in place so that uh, even uh, what, what the laws did was instead of um, restricting Japan's uh, actions legally, uh, now it's up to the politics to decide what Japan should do. Uh, of course, the footnote with that is, uh, is, is the institution, enough institution in place for Japan to make that decision or not? I, I argue probably not. But uh, 
But beyond Korean Peninsula, if Japan were to do things beyond that, uh, maybe the revision of the constitution is necessary. But it seems that the, the, the laws are in place so that uh, bringing the Japan closer to US-Japan alliance may, may not be the necessary condition to revise the constitution. And on the other hand, there are, so people think that, uh, and, and if you can see in the Prime Minister Abe's uh, behavior, uh, he went to the Trump Tower before Mr. Trump was uh, uh, inaugurated and, uh, and, and really sort of embracing the United States and, and therefore embracing and consolidating the alliance. Uh, but on the one hand, uh, and, and people think that that is necessary, but there are doubts about US credibility, which leads to the fear of uh, Credibility, meaning that Mr. Trump might be more aggressive and, and more accepting of the use of force than the uh, people of Japan would like. And this would lead to the fear of entrapment. On the other hand, there is a fear of abandonment. Uh, this, uh, uh, will Japan, will U US really defend Japan? And, and from the statements that uh, Mr. Trump made during the campaign, I think uh, worried many Japanese for this reason. So fear of abandonment leads Japan to think about plan B as a backup. And this would be the multilateral cooperation that is happening and maybe being increasing with Australia, India, and ASEAN, and, and even China, and, and in UN. Uh, which, but the uh, interesting thing is, in order for Japan to do this with other partners, and even with the more increased participation in UN, does involve probably a, a necessity, a revision of the constitution, because uh, as Soya Sensei was explaining, uh, the constitution doesn't allow uh, Japan to do things outside of self-defense. Uh, so um, currently, Japan doesn't have any UN peacekeeping operations overseas. Uh, troops from South Sudan had returned. So um, I, I think it's, it's now probably, uh, if Japan wants to do more of this as sort of a plan B outside of the uh, security alliance, uh, the, maybe the revision might be necessary. But overall, I think there is this, all these things happening and pulling, so that that results in the support for uh, the status quo. Uh, I have to hurry up a bit. Um, so what are the drivers for change in domestic? So Mr. Abe uh, has managed to change the rules within the LDP. Uh, the, the, the previous rule was that the uh, president of the LDP, which sort of equals prime minister of Japan, uh, can only do two terms of three years, so six terms maximum. But he changed it to three years, uh, three terms is possible, so three times three, nine years. So uh, September 2018 is, is the, the end of the second of the uh, three terms, so at the end of the six years. Uh, so uh, theoretically, in, in the rule that he can be the president and therefore the prime minister until September of two, 2021. And one of the reasons probably why he dissolved the, the uh, parliament was so that he would be in a good position uh, to, to consolidate the seats that he had. However, um, if you ask the people, uh, and, and you have to remember that the, Mr. Abe is still quite popular amongst the people, uh, but should, should, do you think uh, Abe, Prime Minister Abe uh, should do the third term? 51.9% of the people are opposed and 41.5% a favor. And this is from an FNN, which is a Sanke, which is a more right uh, conservative uh, newspaper uh, TV. So usually the public opinion polls uh, come out favoring uh, the, the incumbent and the government, but there's still 52% opposed. So many precipitate, this may precipitate change because he, Prime Minister Abe might think that he doesn't have until 2012, 21 to work this thing, the agenda out, but only until September 2018. But it seems that the, the, uh, the, the debate within the LDP and also with Komeito are not really going into that direction. Uh, they are more, much more cautious. Uh, even within the LDP, a lot of the politicians are saying, maybe we should take long time to discuss this rather than doing precipitately uh, by adding the third clause. Uh, we'll see. So there might be, there, there is a, probably a, a drive from the prime minister, but uh, the, the others are much uh, more sort of uh, restrained on this. Uh, partly uh, because uh, I think Although Mr. Abe has won greatly, uh, his uh, 
popular support may be waning uh, because of uh, things, nothing to do with uh, constitutional security, uh, but more to do with uh, domestic and uh, some of the uh, handling of the, the scandals that uh, happened. Um, Another thing that's interesting is uh, pension, healthcare. These are the top agenda for the public, uh, as always. And uh, pension, 25.4% uh, of, of, of the public thinks that this is what uh, should be on the top of the agenda for, for the government to be handling. Only 2.8% says that the constitution. So there is a, a strong incentive uh, well, for, for the public to be supporting this rather than the, uh, the constitution. And, and the other thing domestically is the opposition party, which had more than the majority vote, uh, which are fragmented, could they unite or not? If they remain split, that means by default, uh, the government will be in, in, in power and uh, have the two-thirds majority necessary. Uh, internationally, North Korea and uh, um, China uh, and US and President Trump uh, would be uh, the drivers. Uh, for for change, um, North Korea uh, for of what it could do if it shoots a missile and if a uh, conflict develops. Obviously, uh, that would make the people be more accepting of a change. And uh, China, uh, but not necessarily Senkaku Islands, because I think that part is uh, clearly a self-defense realm. So the the current laws will be sufficient. To, for Japan to defend the islands. Uh, but it, if it's beyond that, uh, maybe it will be legally difficult. Um, approval of the rating of the USJ summit uh, was 61%, so very high. So people really like the idea of Mr. Trump and Abe shaking hands for a long time. So that's, that's clearly in being supported. But should this change? I think that might be a driver, meaning that if Mr. Trump becomes, if the abandonment fear becomes greater, I think there might be a debate within the Japan to say that maybe we should do more to either consolidate or to seek other ways of uh, intervening. Um, in conclusion, status quo bias is strong, and uh, Japanese people are scared of North Korean missiles, wary of China, and supports the US alliance, but unsure of Mr. Uh, President Trump. The government of Japan has not de delivered what the Japanese people want the most, which is a stable pension plan. And uh, if you remember that uh, uh, Mr. Abe had to resign the first time he was in office because of this uh, pension plan. So this is something that he probably has learned a lesson to kind of stay away. But this is still the, the biggest thing. And unfortunately, it's very difficult with the given, uh, and, and it's a fortunate thing that we have so many uh, longevity in Japan, but it's also uh, making it difficult to, to finance this. Um, if GOJ was able to deliver this, of course, it would be much more stable and then the support of the, the government will be stable, which would enable the prime minister to go ahead with the more of the constitutional revision, but currently, uh, maybe not. One thing to remember, uh, one concern that I have is all of this sort of assumes that it's probably is going to, Japan is going to stay proactive pacifist, uh, proactive isolationist. Um, so in that sense, um, who will be the defender of the liberal international orders? We don't really see a strong drive from that, from the United States at the moment, and, uh, and Japan, although you know, all the, um, the explanation that Mr. Abe gave in uh, the world needing Japan, and it's a dangerous world, and therefore we have to do this together, I don't really see domestic inwards out a uh, strong drive for the defending the liberal international order, which, which uh, personally uh, worries me a lot. Okay, with that, thank you very much.
Hi, I'm Tarun Chabra, um, uh, like Tom, a fellow with our project on international order uh, and strategy, and I'm grateful to Richard for inviting me uh, to join this discussion today, um, uh, and to Yoshi and Chicago for their comments as well. I'll be brief. I know that you're all probably eager for some uh, give and take here at this point. Um, uh, so, so I'll just start by saying um, that I um, agree with um, much of what Tom said uh, about the stickiness of the uh, what we sometimes call the international architecture here and the uh, and core pillars of the liberal order. Um, uh, uh, Chicago mentioned it as well in, in terms of the, the status quo bias. Um, uh, I think much could be said also for the stickiness about our democratic institutions in the face of threats to them domestically, um, and we should talk about that more, and we should understand better why they are sticky um, uh, if we care about them and we, we think that they're important for our security. Uh, but the words I agree with most that Tom articulated are that could change. Um, uh, I, I think that the consensus could over the long term be more fragile than we think it is. Uh, but I remain open to disagreement on it. I hope we'll discuss that. And I think that's what people at Brookings and many other places should be working on and researching. Um, so I initially planned to offer um, an insider's perspective uh, as a former National Security Council and Pentagon staffer. Um, and I still will, in a sense, but what I really want to offer this morning uh, is a short provocation that I addresses our subject of the politics of foreign policy by, in good Brookings fashion, poking a bit at our mandate this morning. Um, and the description of the event that you all signed up for indicates that we will, quote, examine the role that domestic politics and public opinion have on foreign policy making and to discuss how recent elections have helped or hindered officials in Washington and Tokyo as they pursue their foreign policy agendas. Uh, so by their agendas, um, we could mean the agendas of the presidentially appointed heads of departments and agencies, uh, and or we could mean the career civil servants who staff them. Uh, and there's, of course, an important distinction between the two. But either way, I think we do have in mind, and the intention here was to capture the agenda of the so-called foreign policy establishment as opposed to elected officials. Uh, and this picture of the foreign policy establishment fielding its own foreign policy agenda, bobbing and weaving around the direction of elected officials, on some occasions at least, is to some extent a vindication of the critique, uh, a critique that that gained significant traction over the course of President Trump's rise to power, and I believe one that foreign policy professionals in democracies, especially those experiencing nationalist or populist moments, must take more seriously. So what is this critique about? So let's take, for example, a piece published this week uh, by the recently departed uh, acting director of national intelligence, Mike Dempsey, who wrote an article um, in an online uh, blog that many of you will know, War on the Rocks, highlighting his advice for, quote, better national security decision making. Uh, and he concluded the piece with the following advice, which I think nicely encapsulates the impulse that critics on the right and the left, as Tom pointed out, uh, 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 are calling out. Uh, uh, and Dempsey wrote the following, quote, keep co politics out of national security decision making. Domestic political considerations have always been checked at the door of the situation room. And why is that? In simple terms, it's because if domestic politics are introduced into any national security debate, they will become the backdrop to every discussion. Indeed, there is no faster way to breed cynicism and doubt among national security professionals, especially within departments and officials serving uh, with uh, within departments uh, serving in harm's way, than to create the perception that a decision has more to do with domestic politics than the country's security interests. The exclusion of politics from the policymaking process is a proud tradition that must be safeguarded by everyone involved at all costs." End quote. So I can say with first-hand knowledge that this sentiment ac accurately captures a pretty sacrosanct canon of conduct within the U.S. government's national security apparatus. Not only is it advised to check politics at the door, as Dempsey says, uh, in order to advance a Solomonic and Platonic national interest, uh, there is a deep pride uh, in at least posturing and doing so. Uh, and conversely, there's deep outrage when politics is perceived to be brought in. So many of you will recall the response to the White House uh, announcement that the president's then chief strategist, uh, alt-right lightning rod Steve Bannon, would have a seat on the principles committee uh, of the White House National Security Council. The foreign policy establishment across both parties was apoplectic, and some, yes, because they lamented the elevation of 
Bannon's ideological impulses from the, quote, Internet's dark corners into the national security firmament. Uh, but the establishment objected especially because Bannon's seat on the NSC was testament to, quote, policy in discipline. Um, when Bannon was later removed from the body, uh, it, uh, one commentator wrote that it was, quote, a position Bannon never should have occupied in the first place. And Republicans accused Trump of uh, going even further than President Obama, who in the words of two Republican strategists had, quote, presided over the most politicized national security policymaking process in recent times, blurring the lines between the president's partisan political interest and the national interest. So this critique has also come from the left, uh, as two progressive historians wrote in a foreign, appar foreign affairs piece in April of this year. Uh, another passage here. For too long, foreign policy experts have isolated themselves from the public. Confined to the coastal cities, experts have failed to engage citizens where they live and work. Worse, experts typically tell the public what must be done instead of presenting options from which the public can choose, and they deny ordinary people their due as the ultimate decision makers in a democracy. No wonder the public is showing the back of its hand, refusing to take experts seriously." End quote. So this kind of criticism of the US foreign policy establishment it is, is actually not new. Um, President Reagan's ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, accused the foreign policy establishment in the 80s of conduct conducting itself like some priestly class that alone has the knowledge, experience, and wisdom to guide foreign policy. And uh, 40 years ago, uh, former Brookings fellows, Richard Betts and Les Gelb, similarly critiqued the foreign policy establishment in their book about the US, uh, US involvement in the war in Vietnam. Uh, Betts and Gelb wrote at that time in 1979 uh, that domestic politics is a dirty phrase in the inner sanctum of foreign policy making. There is an American myth that politics stops at the water's edge, that the normal play of partisan competition and dissent gives way to unity in matters of foreign policy, and this myth creates great pressure to uh, keep one's mouth shut, to think and speak of foreign affairs as above mere politics and something sacred. Uh, Betts and Gelb's indictment will be recognizable to many of you uh, that insularity leads to bad policy because it was echoed in Bannon's critique uh, uh, after leaving the administration, saying the geniuses of both parties in the foreign policy elite left President Trump essentially the Bay of Pigs in Venezuela, the Cuban Missile Crisis in Korea, and the Vietnam War in Afghanistan all at the same time. So where does, this, uh, uh, where does this leave the Trump administration? Where does the Trump administration settle out uh, in this give and take? Uh, and I think it's a mixed picture, as Tom uh, alluded to. So in many respects, it's the same place. Uh, in his address on Afghanistan, after months of internal deliberations, the president said, quote, decisions are different when you sit behind the desk in the Oval Office. On other foreign policy questions too, such as US-Russia relations, there appears to be a uh, striking schizophrenia between what the president has to say about the imperative of improving ties with Moscow for its own sake uh, uh, versus the much more hawkish rhetoric about Russia from senior Trump administration officials confirmed by the Senate uh, that sounds a lot like the Romney presidential campaign circa 2012. Um, but in other respects, and here Tom alluded to this as well, the president seems intent on sticking to the domestic political commitments he's made uh, in his bid for the Republican nomination. Just yesterday, of course, he made good on his commitment to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, despite the chorus of opposition from his own senior advisors, allies, and foreign policy experts around the world. And on international trade, 2018 especially promises to be a big year as NAFTA negotiations come to a head and potentially major White House ordered reviews focused on China will come due. And these reviews will focus on the impacts of trade uh, and investment on US intellectual property and innovation, as well as the US manufacturing and defense industrial base. Uh, but also outside the administration, there's a recognition or at least a bet that the foreign policy concerns Trump raised are likely to endure well beyond his presidency, uh, even if there's low confidence that Trump himself will prove capable of addressing any of these concerns. So popping up around Washington are new ventures, such as uh, a project on Massachusetts Avenue focused on 
uh, what is being called a grand strategy for the middle class, uh, another that tours European officials around America's heartland, and two more uh, here at Brookings, in fact, um, one focused on burden sharing in international security arrangements, um, such as NATO and America's alliances uh, in Asia, and another uh, with the Charles Koch Institute that's uh, essentially a roadshow of debates on the future of U.S. foreign policy, uh, in which we are taking foreign uh, prominent foreign policy figures to cities uh, around the country debate big and big question uh, big and basic questions about America's role in the world uh, that many of us I think would have to agree have been taken for granted uh, for at least a generation so uh, in conclusion these are all encouraging steps I think toward a more democratically responsive foreign policy one that I personally hope sustains America's global alliances and commitments uh, but with more solid democratic backing um, yet much more work needs to be done especially on the front of bureaucratic politics and how politics is, how policy is made in Washington uh, more specifically, how future administrations can better integrate our foreign and domestic policymaking processes, uh, a proposition that I'm confident will encounter enormous resistance uh, in the foreign policy culture that I have described. Uh, and ironically, I think it's precisely as China and Russia energize and maybe even collude in their efforts to undermine the credibility of democracy itself that it will be most tempting for our national security establishment to retreat into itself on the logic of George Kennan, who lamented that when it came to foreign policy, democracy Democracy is akin to, quote, a prehistoric monster, as long as this room with a brain the size of a pin. I hope that we do not, and I look forward to our discussion. Uh, well, I'd like to thank uh, each of our presenters for some really insightful uh, presentations. I'd like to thank uh, Chicago and Yoshi for coming all this way to participate in the program, and to thank uh, Tom for coming from the fifth floor and Tarun for coming from the fourth floor <laughs> to be with us today. It was a long um, way. Excuse me? It was a long way. <laughs> um, I have lots of questions that I would like to ask, uh, but I think it's uh, unfair to you for me to uh, occupy that time. Uh, we're running behind schedule. We'll probably go over uh, a little bit. So I'm going to throw it open right now and start right here. Okay, wait for the mic, uh, identify yourself, and uh, try and keep your questions short. I'm Barry Wood from RTHK in Hong Kong, although mm -hmm. resident here in DC. I'd like to ask our two Japanese uh, panelists, mm -hmm. what about China? Uh, here is Mr. Xi at the, uh, uh, his presentation last month saying that it's China's turn to, to dominate. Uh, what about uh, Japan? Does Japan feel it can compete with China? How does it feel about the rise of China? How does it feel about perhaps the United States shifting its principal Asian partnership to China <coughs> from Japan? I think what's happening actually is the more uh, Tokyo emphasizes the so-called threat of China, uh, the more Japan become dependent on the US. Mm 
leaning toward the US. I think that's, what, that's what's happening. And uh, so, so, so that's why and how US policy toward China are so important. And uh, if US moves in the direction of accommodating China, I think that concern was one of the factors which led to Prime Minister Abe's performance toward President Trump. Chicago? Yes, I, I agree. I think there is concern in Japan about a uh, threat from uh, potential problems from the, the rise of China. But what's interesting is that very few people see China as a near peer competitor to the United States, um, even in the policy circles. But I think definitely in the public, very few people would uh, answer that, uh, would ask, you know, do you think China will overtake US? I think probably of the, all the countries that uh, surveyed, Japan is one of the lowest that believe in, in China overtaking the United States. So uh, the problems that are posed by China are not necessarily the kind of uh, military, uh, traditionally military threat per se. Of course, the Senkaku issue is, is great, but that's different from the sort of the bigger threat of a uh, uh, bigger, bigger sort of a uh, um, some something like an invasion and an attack on Japan. So, so the concern is more about the political influence that China could exercise, uh, and that I think economically and politically its influence growing is probably the bigger concern. Uh, the, the militarily, I think, trying to keep China within the island chain, not letting it go into the Pacific uh, Ocean, is important. But that's probably. Uh, not shared by, by the public, per se, as, as something that uh, is, is uh, necessary to do uh, militarily. Tom or Tarun, do you have any comments on this question? Um, I'm happy to uh, wait. OK. <laughs> uh, Mike, and then I'll go back there. Yeah, to follow up on uh, Barry's uh, question, was there much reaction in Japan when stories started appearing last spring, I guess it was, or in the summer, that during the height of the island crisis back in 2014, uh, that the Chinese had done a table, maybe this was in McGregor's book, uh, had done a tabletop exercise and concluded that they would lose a naval confrontation with Japan, and the one thing the Chinese Communist Party could not survive is a military defeat by Japan. Anybody? So, so, um, I, it's a comment, right? Yeah. No, it's a question, right? Yeah, the question was, was there much response to this revelation in Japan? I don't. I haven't heard. I don't think so yeah. because I, I am not knowledgeable of of that part. But uh, uh, and uh, okay. but so. not not many Japanese may believe that the case, perhaps, mm -hmm. which is important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the woman back there in the pink. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Thorne from the Asia Society Policy Institute. So, um, Chikako, you mentioned at the end of your speech the you posed the question of who will be the defender of the international liberal order. How do you think that Japan's um, continued uh, pursuit of TPP 11 mm -hmm. falls within mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. do you see perhaps Japan being able to take the lead on the economic front mm -hmm. in terms of upholding mm -hmm. those institutions? And of course, that question could be answered also by other people. I think the hope and plan is to have the TPP-11, uh, so when the United States may change its policies and uh, would uh, uh, return back to the TPP regime, then, then the TPP itself will be ready uh, to, to receive the United States back. So um, I think maybe TPP is important for the economy of Japan, uh, but it's also seen as a strategic tool to... Uh, to have a rule-based order and, and where China would be a part of that, but still constrained by the rules. So that's the sort of the more long-term long scheme. Uh, so that, that's probably uh, still the case and, and is seen as a, 
uh, hopeful. So you could you could say maybe international liberal order in that sense of a, a more rule-based order uh, in, in the economic realm. But it's yeah. also consistent with your finding your what you reported about polling that suggests that the Japanese public wants to see. Um, Japan's international role in a kind of civilian terms, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. so much in security mm -hmm. terms, which you've written about a lot. Mm. Yeah, I, I think the reason that Prime Minister Abe uh, was very supportive of TPP originally was because of the two things which Kako has just mentioned. And the one is it's a boost to Abenomics uh, and the, in the domain of structural reform of, of Japanese economy and the system. And secondly, I think it's China, China dimension. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so originally, after learning President Trump's you know, uh, decision, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe became a little bit uh, unenthusiastic about it. Uh, but now, I think he's promoting this with the expectation still in mind. I mean, when, I mean, the expectation that the US would eventually come back. Maybe that would be post-Trump uh, era, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's what uh, the current government is, is thinking and how they are approaching this issue now. But if I may allow to present my own personal view on this, Please. I think this is a very important scheme uh, because it doesn't have both or either US or China. You know, so mm -hmm. trying something, uh, you know, by kind of countries who are breathing between the United States and China, I think has a strong merit as East Asians, you know, think about our region by ourselves on the basis of our preferences and what sort of East Asia, I mean, the South, South Americans are here, but, uh, you know, what sort of Asia Pacific we'd like to see on our own merits. And then on the basis of that, think of the role of the U.S., and the role of China. I think this could be an important platform to exercise such a thinking as well as you know, actual policy negotiations. But, but, I, but I don't think that's how the policymakers in Tokyo uh, are perceiving this. Okay. My colleague Maria Solis. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick reaction to uh, the comments by Tom and Tarun about the stickiness of the global economic order. Uh, maybe I'm a little too close to the subject matter because I feel less optimistic. I can see signs of deconstruction underway. Think about NAFTA, for example. This is not just a common renegotiation. It's being carried out under the threat of withdrawal. And it's really a question mark whether this agreement will make it through next year or not. Think about the heating of the uh, U.S.-China uh, friction that Tarun re made reference to. I would make the case that even though some of the instruments may be familiar to us from the 1980s when Japan and the United States were having bouts of economic friction, we should not use that as a reference because uh, the structure of the situation is different. Japan and the United States are alliance partners, and that always provided a glue to come to an agreement. China and the United States are not in that uh, position. And I also think about what's happening with a multilateral system, and I see it as perhaps one of its most critical moments. You know, everybody referred to the Doha round not making it, but now when we're talking about the dispute settlement mechanism running into serious difficulties, and there's a huge case making its way through the WTO regarding China's market economy status. So I am a little bit uh, confident that the status quo is as sticky as we uh, perhaps would like it to be. And then my uh, other very brief observation is on the path forward. Um, I, you know, I very much can see the, the merits of making the case that these trade agreements are politically too costly and maybe we should just talk about other broader frameworks that talk about what to do with automation and so forth. I would make the case that the solutions that work for one will work for the other and that there's a limit to what international cooperation can do because at the end of the day, tying with the theme of a domestic politics event, some of the measures that have the most impact are purely domestic, and I'm thinking of the U.S. tax bill now currently under consideration. We don't know what the specific items will be at the end of the day, but we have a good sense that perhaps a superior education will be out of reach for more Americans at a time when those skills are necessary to deal with the current technological trends, and income inequality may also take a hit. Thanks. Response? Sure. Um, so I agree and definitely 
uh, defer to Murray. You're the expert on TPP, and um, but I agree with your overall point too that um, I do think, uh, as I think I said, that the economic side is a bit of an exception, or it's it's separate than the security one. Um, the security infrastructure, I think, has been very sticky and is pretty fungible, and I think does stand to our benefit today, right, that it's in place. And the economic side has always been a little bit different. I think U.S. leadership on the economic side has been uneven. You know, think of Richard Nixon, you know, plenty of other examples in the Cold War. It, hasn't, it wasn't as, I think, uh, continuous and as predictable. Um, as, as the alliances um, have been. Um, and I do think, uh, for the reasons you say, that it will, you know, that there are, that that is beginning to fray. However, um, you know, there's still, uh, as you noted at the end, the economic engagement of the US and the world is much more than these trading agreements, too, right? And so uh, globalization will continue, maybe with a slightly different hue than before, but it's not going away uh, anytime soon. And so that, I think, is an unrelenting logic that the Trump administration or anyone else will have to deal with. And the fact that they found it so difficult to operationalize protectionist uh, measures against China, I think, goes uh, to that point, too. But I, I, I do agree, though, on the basic point that I think the economic order is a bit more fragile. And the event I worry about the most is, a, is another financial crisis, because of course, the reason the last financial crisis was not as severe uh, in its totality as 29 to 33 was because of the response. And so if the response the next time is more nationalistic and bigger than thy neighbor, uh, then we could have a similar result to, to that which occurred uh, in the 30s. Question in the back, and then I'll come here, and then go there. Right there, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Richard Lemmerman. I'm, uh, 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 investor, but uh, a longtime resident of Tokyo. Um, I was uh, at something on Capitol Hill yesterday where they were rolling out a report on national uh, industrial policy. And one of the things that, that was brought up was that, in fact, um, one of the reasons that perhaps the U.S. doesn't have a national industrial policy was that uh, security issues tend to uh, take over. For example, you can imagine... Um, uh, if you have an issue with China, uh, you might, on an economic side, you know, you might be more concerned about what they're going to do with Korea as opposed to worrying about the economic issues. And the question comes to, don't, in fact, Japan and the United States have a huge uh, commonality of interest in areas like cyber, in areas where uh, there are other state actors that are hacking into our private companies and stealing IP? Um, and don't, in fact, you know, is there, is there a consensus for that kind of cooperation? Because I, I just see a lot more um, abilities for Japan and the United States to work together uh, on many issues than otherwise. Anybody? I think the United States, uh, well, militarily has a, a cyber command and has been pushing and, and uh, talking with the Japanese government uh, for Japan to increase the cyber securities aspect, and I think the two countries are working together. Uh, but beyond the military, uh, economically, I, I'm not so. I, I'm not. Uh, I, I don't really know how much is going on in the civilian side side of the cyber uh, security per se. Um, I agree with your basic point, and and it's not just the United States and Japan. It's probably Korea, and also um, the European Union. I mean, we're all affected by the same sort of policies. Uh, there was a case a few years ago when China put forward a policy of indigenous innovation, uh, and there was a, a fairly sharp reaction, uh, but there was also concerted action uh, in sort of these, the, most of the advanced countries going to China and saying, this is not consistent with our ideas about free and fair trade, and China sort of backed off. Uh, but collective action is hard. It, it depends on the, um, the willingness of leaders of uh, um, parties with uh, somewhat different interests uh, to work together. So there's a question there, and then I'll go there. Uh, on the aisle there. Right. Abigail, please. 
Uh, thank you very much, Taisu Kimi, by uh, the senior uh, visiting fellow with the Atlantic Council from Japan. I have one question to Professor Soya and one question to Professor Ueki. Uh, Professor Soya argued that uh, Japan and the United States might need to revise uh, the, uh, the Japan US Security Treaty uh, uh, given the you know, uh, new literature in Japan. But can we argue that you know, this uh, uh, literature, including the revision of the you know, interpretation of the constitutional law, is a kind of a unilateral declaration of Japan of the willingness? You know, to cooperate with the United States in terms of uh, uh, collective self-defense force, so that uh, Japan does not necessarily have to bind itself by promising uh, to the United States that we would do that. You know, uh, with the revision of the Japan US Security Treaty. This is a question, and uh, to Miss uh, uh, Professor Weki. Uh, I sense that uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, can be close to Mr. Trump. Uh, closer to the, any other uh, leaders in the world, uh, uh, it's that you know, uh, in Japan, uh, we did not see a very serious fundamental and uh, instinctive hatred against Mr. Trump, like we see, you know, for example, the European countries. Or, you know, so he does not have to uh, take a political risk uh, in you know, uh, doing this with Mr. Trump. So how you can come up with... Uh, you know, our persuasive uh, interpretation, you know, uh, why we do not have, uh, we do not see this kind of a hatred against Mr. Trump in Japanese society. Yeah, I, I raise this point not because I'm arguing for it. <laughs> and uh, I, I just uh, made a reference to this as a, as a logical thing. Uh, and and uh, this is in a larger context in which I've been arguing this uh, issue, which is revision of Article 9 arguments have, have to be associated with the picture of the U.S.-Japan alliance, specifically uh, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. As I said, Article 5 of the current treaty is premised on Article 9. I mean, and so if you change Article 9, logically speaking, U.S.-Japan security treaties should be revised. For instance, if, if Japan achieves the revision whereby Japan would become a normal country in the sense that Australians, Canadians are engaging in collective security on the basis of UN Sec Security Council decision and in the context of alliance with the U.S. engaging in collective self-defense you know, uh, actions, then uh, security treaty need to be changed. But, but my general point is, uh, change, changing Article 9 sh and the uh, U.S.-Japan security treaty uh, sh sh should be debated as a set. Otherwise, this will not become a truly strategic debate. And uh, as long as changing Article 9 remains as a goal in itself, I think that's the case in Japan. And uh, that's exactly why you know, the, this uh, debate about Article 9 will not lead to the discussion of U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. And so I, I just wanted to make this uh, situation uh, explicit. And uh, so that's the, that's the purpose of myself raising this point. And, uh, and arguing for maybe theoretically, I think I, I'm personally you know, uh, of the opinion that Japan should be able to exercise full right. I mean, that it's normal. It's normal. Like, like many countries. And, uh, but uh, but uh, the, the drive should be future-oriented strategy and national profile of Japan. And this is the context in which I've been arguing for Japan's so-called middle power strategy. So, so revision of Article 9 should be premised on the future of J Japan as a middle power, not as reverting to you know, so-called great power you know, status. And I think that's the only way Article 9 can be revised. But if that happens, I mean, alliance with the United States will become much tighter, and Japan will play a larger internationalist role in the domain of peacekeeping and so forth. And the Canadians have lost more than 150 lives and soldiers in Afghanistan, and even Germany, 50. <coughs> Why not Japan, is my argument. But if I make this 
Outside of Japan, it makes perfect sense, I'm sure, to many. <laughs> but if I say the same thing in Japan, I will be categorized as further right, so <laughs> even uh, to, to Prime Minister Abe. <laughs> you know. So, so, so uh, the Chikako's you know, uh, opinion polls result indicate this. Japanese are not yet ready you know, for mm -hmm. self-defense forces engaging in you know, international peacekeeping activities in the normal sense. So, so this is this is a sort of inconsistency and uh, you know distorted sort of con Japanese domestic context in which these issues are debated, and so my, so my my you know uh, purpose as an academic uh, in introducing this point, you know uh, it should be logical to think about changing you know Article Five of uh, the U.S. Japan Security Treaty if we get into this domain of collective security, self defense. I think this is a perfectly logical thing, but uh, th this doesn't happen in Japanese context. So, so, so why that the case? You know, uh, I think that we need to think about this more, more seriously. I mean, Japanese would need to think about this, and politicians who who are trying to lead this process. Otherwise, this debate will never become truly strategic debate. Uh, in, you know, for, for Japan, that's that's been my kind of personal view on this as an academic. But uh, if I ever become a politician, which will never happen, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say this, <laughs> you know, because it doesn't work in Japanese society and politics. Yeah. Chikako, do you want to address the second question? Okay, so why, why don't the Japanese people hate President Trump was probably the question. Right? Uh, and before I answer, I, I must make a little bit of a correction to my conclusion. I said Japan will probably uh, maintain as a proactive pacifist, I meant to say reactive <laughs> pacifist, so reactive to the things that happen. But uh, um, I think during the campaign, uh, the two things that really uh, made the Japanese people concerned was one was uh, Mr. Trump's argument about uh, the, this trade uh, war still going on with Japan kind of a rhetoric. So on the one hand, people were worried about what, what would be the the demand from Mr. Trump once he's in office in terms of the trade and the deficit. Uh, the other one was, uh, you know, the, the abandonment in the security realm and, and maybe giving Japan a nuclear weapon was a good idea, which, which signaled that extended deterrence might not be in place. So those two things really were worries that Japanese uh, officials, uh, security, foreign policy community, and even the public had. So once in office, I think it was important for uh, the government and Mr. Abe to embrace Mr. Trump. So I think a lot of the Japanese were relieved that uh, uh, Mr. Trump, after all, is uh, more understanding of Japan and, and, and U.S.-Japan relations. So it didn't really go to, to this uh, uh, criticizing uh, Mr. Trump uh, because they were worried in the beginning and relieved. Um, but but step, taking a step a little bit back, um, I think there are two things maybe at work. One is that um, regardless of what Mr. Trump's personal views might be and regardless of what the criticism in this country might be of Mr. Trump from some uh, in media and things that are also uh, introduced in, in Japan as well, I think people in Japan do view Mr. Trump as democratically elected uh, president of the United States. So people might feel that it's not really in their part to criticize a leader which the, the American people have chosen and, and through due process and institutionally. So that, that's one. The other is how much does Japan really have a strong uh, conviction to defend, uh, you know, pluralism, tolerance, uh, diversity. Japan is a very free country. It's very diverse. Even politically, we even have a communist party, which is, has a significant support. And, and uh, so it's a, it's a very diverse, and, and there's a, a now some uh, local uh, municipal governments are uh, accepting uh, same-sex marriage and things. So, so even in the, in, in the other social uh, realm, it's, it's becoming more diverse. But does re Japan really stand firm uh, on this? And how much cost is Japan and Japanese people willing to pay to defend these, uh, uh, the rights of the people? How much imag imagination does Japanese people have of the things, uh, the, the rights taken away from uh, 
you know, somebody they've never seen living in Africa or some parts of the world that they've never really heard of. You, you need to have some imagination of what these things mean. Uh, you're right. If it, they're important to you, they obviously should be important to the others as well. I'm, I'm not sure if Japanese people, because it's still an island country, it's very homogenous, uh, and, and the institutions are very much in place. Japanese people didn't really fight for civil rights. Uh, they were given after the war. So in, in some sense, I think there's a lack of this uh, um, sort, of a, um, sort of a danger or a threat. A perception of threat is something that uh, could affect them is happening. And, and uh, these uh, ideas that came out and, and the leader of the strongest and, and the freest nation on the globe is uh, uh, represented by somebody who, who many Japanese don't think is. When President Obama was in place, one of the best sellers in Japan was the, the transcripts and speeches. It came with a CD of, uh, of all of his uh, uh, address at the Democratic National Convention and his own, and, and the Japanese people really listened to the CD and memorized his speeches as, as a, and it was a big, big seller. You could see it in the, the bookstores and things. So although there was no like a strong opposition to what Mr. Trump was saying, I think there is a constituency that really welcomed uh, President Obama because it sort of thought, I think, to many Japanese, but it was a progress for human humankind in some way. So, I mean, I know people don't hate Mr. Trump, but I think uh, some are, uh, worried, concerned, and disappointed. Uh, but it, it, it is the president that the, the people of America has chosen, so, so no really criticism there. Is, uh, uh, to be uh, technical, he was chosen by the majority of the Electoral College. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the person in the back uh, who had his hand up, and this will be the last. Well, uh, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kobayashi uh, from Japan International Cooperation Agency, uh, headed by Dr. Kitaoka. Uh, who thinks that Japan uh, has a uh, stronger uh, role to play uh, for defending uh, international liberal order, including through uh, international development. Um, and I hope there's uh, room for that. Um, and, uh, but my question goes to uh, Thomas and Tarun, uh, and this uh, in a way relates to uh, what uh, Dr. Salas asked already about the stickiness. And uh, we've seen how the uh, greater skepticism towards multilateralism uh, evidenced by a recent pulling out from the Global Compact on Migration. And uh, we're all wondering how much further uh, the U.S. would go uh, against multilateralism. And I wanted to um, ha ha ask for your insights on this topic. Thank you. So I, I, I think to start with, um, you know, the... the the views on multilateralism have actually not, generally not strayed too far from Republican foreign policy orthodoxy, right? If anything, I'd say they're probably a little bit friendlier than they were during the first term of the Bush administration. Um, uh, if you compare Nikki Haley to John Bolton, for example, uh, uh, and John Bolton, as you all know, has not to, to date been appointed uh, in the Trump administration, uh, including uh, for any sort of post re related to the United Nations or multilateralism more generally. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind, and there are also indications that the Secretary of State, um, the President himself, are actually working quite closely with a number, with the Secretary General and a number of senior UN envoys uh, to address hotspots around the world um, in a way that many would not have expected. But I, I agree with um, Maria and I think Tom, too. I think we're generally in agreement that trade is the area where there um, is the most um, capacity for backsliding. Uh, in a way, but I think we have to recognize that you know those of us who support free trade, that consensus of the foreign, foreign policy establishment, I think you know, had really lost the argument in the United States for a long time. I mean, I personally was working as an aide to the Secretary of Defense um, for Ash Carter when he was asked to be the spokesperson for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, and at that point, I knew that it was game over. Um, <laughs> uh, if he was go going to be the one, they'd lost the domestic argument. And, and, I, and, and there, there, are, there are some, you know, there's some polling data that suggests that actually the opposition to free trade is not as bad as you would think, but it's actually become more partisan now, and it suggests that people are now more, uh, more in favor of free trade because President Trump is in office. So I think some of that, um, move, some of that is ephemeral. Um, uh, so, uh, again, I, I think trade really is the outlier. 
and the president's been pretty, um, I think, uh, consistent about that. Um, well, I've kept all of you beyond the time that uh, we promised, and uh, so I uh, think we should wrap up. But uh, thank you very much for your questions. Please join me in thanking our four outstanding panelists.